Hi again, Greg Bell of the News Tribune here at CenturyLink Field in Seattle. The Seahawks couldn't overcome everything tonight. They couldn't overcome Richard Sherman being absent for the first time in six years. They couldn't overcome Cam Chancellor not being in the secondary either. They couldn't overcome rookie starting right cornerback Shaquille Griffin getting injured on the first drive of the game, possible concussion and not returning. Earl Thomas was the only member of the Legion of Boom back there. They are the Legion of Backups now, and it has changed the Seahawks' defense and their season. They lose 34-31 to the Atlanta Falcons today, tonight on Monday Night Football, despite holding Matt Ryan under 200 yards. That's the first time the NFL's reigning MVP threw for almost 5,000 yards last season, has thrown for fewer than 200 yards in 60 games. But the Seahawks' defensive secondary being so changed, they couldn't get off the field. Atlanta converted nine of their first 12 third downs, many of those short passes to Julio Jones, slant routes in front of Jeremy Lane, who was starting in place of Richard Sherman, who of course is out with that torn Achilles for the season. They were obviously picking on Lane from the start, and they were doing it with an all-pro receiver in Jones, but it wasn't just him. The first touchdown of the game after a return to midfield of the opening kickoff that Blair Walsh saved a touchdown on to start the game, First touchdown of the game, Ryan threw over Justin Coleman, who wasn't even on the Seahawks team until a trade with New England in September. Mohamed Sanu made a one-handed catch over him. Jeremy Lane had a pass interference penalty that set up a touchdown by giving Atlanta the ball on the one-yard line. Lane is the easy target here, but again, he's not supposed to be here. The Seahawks tried to trade him. They did trade him to Houston a few weeks ago, of course, but Lane got sent back because he failed a physical. And all that was after the Seahawks bench Lane from his starting right cornerback job in place of, in favor of Griffin and bench Lane of his nickel job in favor of Coleman. Russell Wilson, brilliant again tonight. 286 yards passing, another 80, 258 passing, another 86 yards rushing, 344 total yards from the Seahawks quarterback. The Seahawks only gained 360, 96% of the yardage the Seahawks amassed came either from Russell's, Russell Wilson's legs or his arm. Once again, there is no running game except for Russell Wilson on scrambles away from pass rushers. They didn't run read option. They just ran Wilson scrambling away on pass calls. They started Mike Davis tonight, who they just had the former San Francisco 49er way by the 49ers last spring, called up from the practice squad last week. And he was the next lead runner. Thomas Rawls was a healthy and active for the second time in his career and the second time in the last two months. Eddie Lacy got just three carries for this many yards. J.D. McKissick, seven carries for 30 yards. Mike Davis had six carries for 18 yards and made a couple nice bullish runs to do so, one for 13 yards. He also made some catches and screen passes, two catches for 41 yards as the Seahawks go increasingly now to screen passes in the passing game to offset the pass rush is going to come in anyway. Figure if they're going to beat our offensive linemen, let them come in and we'll throw over them and send our linemen out the block for the pass catcher. They ran a screen with Tyler Lockett that way for yardage in the first half, two to Mike Davis for 40 yards as well. So the screen pass, which has been a foreign object and foreign asset in Pete Carroll's offense since he's been here with the Seahawks since 2010, is now a function, a, a big part or bigger part of the Seahawks offense simply because there remains no consistent pass protection. Okay, a couple things. Griffin's got a concussion. Uh, Pete Carroll hasn't said how serious that is, but it forced them down to their eighth option at defensive back, Nico Thorpe. The decisions. First of all, to go for the fake field goal with 10 seconds left in the first half when, without a timeout, if he gains it, he's gonna, they're gonna have to rush, spike the ball, and try a field goal anyway if he gets the first down on fourth and one. Shovel pass from holder John Ryan to Luke Wilson went nowhere because Grady Jarrett of the Falcons burst through the line and stopped Wilson behind the line of scrimmage. So instead of three points, it would have made it a 24-20 game at the half. It remained 24-17, and I don't have to tell you how valuable those three points would have been at the end of the game because the Seahawks lost by three. Carroll said he was trying to be staying aggressive, and they saw something in their preparation against the Falcons that thought they could pop that for a touchdown. Of course, it was touchdown or bust with the time remaining and no timeouts. Carroll also cryptically said something about getting out of bounds, but there's no way that the backup tight end, the number two tight end, was going to run from the center of field to out of bounds without getting stopped. And Wilson, Luke Wilson, said it was touchdown or bust as well. 
the call came in and it was unclear whether the field goal unit went on the team with that call or got the call in the huddle. There was a line of timeout before that. Needless to say, that was a very dubious choice. The other one, Doug Baldwin, I thought, lobbied Pete Carroll into challenging a juggled pass on third down here in the fourth quarter. He lobbied and, and made a motion like this with his hand as if to throw the challenge flag to the Seahawks sideline. Carroll did without obviously his coaching staff seeing the replays that I could see in the press box. And actually, I thought I saw it live as well that Baldwin's juggle had caused the ball to bounce off the ground. Anyway, that cost a wasted timeout because the challenge was uh, quickly denied, call upheld. The Seahawks had to punt. They sure could have used that timeout because then they would have had more time at the end of the game. They had used the last timeout on defense before the Falcons had punted. With more time there at the end, they could run another play. Carroll also was going to take one more play with seven seconds left. Then Atlanta, before kicking the, trying the 52-yard field goal at the end that went a yard short by Blair Walsh, he said that he liked during Atlanta's timeout how Blair Walsh was in a good mindset and had prepared. He, I noticed him kicking Walsh at the other 35-yard line on the field, uh, pantomiming kicks with leg swings. And that's why Carroll sent him out to do it then after the timeout rather than risk one more play and the clock possibly running out if the ball had been downed inbounds. Lots to chew on from this, but the bottom line is this is a changed team without Sherman and Chancellor and all the other injuries. They had six defensive starters missing tonight. They now are going to San Francisco on a shorter week Sunday game, but as bad as it looked, all's not lost here. The Seahawks remain only a game behind the Rams for the lead in the NFC West. They have a win over the Rams, of course, already, and the Rams are coming here in a few weeks to CenturyLink Field, but these games are going to look and be different with Russell Wilson, everything on offense, and a patchwork makeshift secondary trying to hold it together against teams that are going to attack them like never before. Read my coverage online at thenewstribune.com or on Twitter, as always, at GBellSeattle. Thanks for watching.